Welcome back, everybody. Uh, next up, we have um, the topic of building an alliance between academia, industry, and government for impactful upskilling. I'd like to invite Sanjeev Gill to come up next. Sanjeev is Associate Vice President Innovation at the University of Waterloo and oversees pan-campus strategies and initiatives that bring together the full innovation capacity of the university to maximize Waterloo's impact on businesses, governments, and society. As Executive Director of Wattspeed, Sanjeev leads Waterloo's thrust in lifelong learning to become the premier provider of learning integrated work offerings for, per, for professionals, corporations, and executives in both industry and government. Welcome, Sanjeev. Thank you very much, Rich, uh, for that introduction. And um, thank you, Rob, Luke, for uh, inviting me to be here today. Just a quick little anecdote here. Um, I met Rob when, uh, when he was at OCADU, and I was at IBM. And uh, that was probably just five, six years ago. At that time, I had no plan or idea to jump ship and come to academia. So here we are. But uh, thank you for that. So I'd like to start um, just by sharing with you uh, a little bit about myself. And I apologize for the fact that there's a massive mug of me on three huge, gigantic screens. But, but just bear with me for a little bit. So. Um, it's important for me to, to, to give you a bit of context because my, my perspectives and my point of view is strictly just a function of my experiences. And so uh, I think it's really important to share with you what those experiences are to some degree. Uh, I was in industry for 20 years, uh, actually 25 years, 20 of those was, uh, were with IBM Canada. And in that time, uh, in that 20 years, I, I did about six different careers inside IBM. Uh, from running uh, the microelectronics division based, based out of Ottawa, running IBM supply chain organization in Markham, uh, then doing client relationships with some of our largest global customers. Um, and eventually I landed myself, my last gig at IBM was um, where I was the intermediary between IBM research and universities and uh, colleges all the way across Canada. So I would meet with presidents of universities and VPs of research. Um, but the reason why I share that with you is because in, in the context of a company like IBM, especially if you're on sort of a leadership track at the organization, it's expected that you switch jobs every five years. And if you're not, people kind of think you're uh, kind of treading water in your career. And that's not necessarily a positive thing. But every time you shift, you have to upskill and you got to reskill and prepare for the next job, especially when you're switching, in my case, from dealing with CTOs and submicron technologies to dealing with trucking companies and, and cross-border issues. The, it's, an, it's an entirely different skill set. And so um, I was incredibly fortunate to have been in an organization like IBM where they invested over your entire career with upskilling and reskilling. At every turn, there is an opportunity to advance your skills, either for upward mobility in the organization or to do a different kind of job, perhaps, in, in a lateral move. Um, if you were on the leadership track, you were fortunate enough to have access to industry university-based education uh, at you know premier institutions like Harvard Business School, Stanford, uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Boston U, the list went on and on. Um, but even if you weren't on that leadership track and, and were able to take advantage of the industry academic collaboration and the education that gave you, um, there were over, when I left, over 4,000 um, online available learning modules at every level of technology that you needed to have delivered globally in multiple languages with badges and assessments. This was 15 years ago. So what we're talking about today is not new stuff. Industry has been doing this for a long time and their delivery model is out of the world. So that's just a little bit of background. So um, I, I, when I left IBM, joined uh, the University of Waterloo, uh, and just a little bit there, uh, I wasn't even 16 months into the job. 
and I was tapped on the shoulder by the president, and uh, he asked if I would be part of a small think tank to rethink what lifelong learning meant to the University of Waterloo. So we, we kind of really reflected on the function of our, of our university, the role that we had, the strengths of our university, predominantly in technology, not just technology, pr but definitely heavily weighted in technology, and said, we have a bigger obligation first and foremost to our alumni, many of which in Waterloo go off, uh, there's a huge entrepreneurial spirit, they go off, they enter the workforce, many of them become CEOs, running big tech companies. Where is our payback to our, fa to our alumni when they leave the borders of the university? Uh, their journey is a lifelong learning journey and we are not there to support them as adequately as we should be. And then we kind of said, well, why stop at our alumni? Shouldn't we just be doing this for all professionals? And so I was asked, based on my experiences, to leave my day job of AVP Innovation 15 months into the job, and uh, please, could you, could you take on the mission of, of reinventing lifelong learning for the University of Waterloo? Uh, quite frankly, um, to me, it was my calling, because here I had an opportunity now to be on the other side uh, of the wall where I was helping to produce the education that would support workers like me over the course of their careers. And so for me, it was like, I'm in, I'm all in. Uh, then of course a little something called the pandemic hit. And so what we ended up doing was one of the first things we did was we called in about 12 of the top Canadian CEOs and heads of multinationals of, of companies operating in Canada. And we asked them a couple of questions, really just two questions. How can we support you during the pandemic? And how can we support you ongoing beyond the pandemic? And almost unanimously they said, Waterloo, you're kind of seen as the MIT of Canada and you're not doing nearly enough for our workforce. We desperately need education and technology. You guys are predominantly a tech school. You need to be doing a lot more. So that was sort of the catalyst and that was actually the reason why I got the budget right in the middle, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Everyone else was kind of like, you know, tightening their belts. We didn't know what to expect with, with student return and so on. Uh, and I was allocated a budget to go off and build Wattspeed and get it done quickly. So um, that's just a little bit about the background, about the impetus and, and kind of the underpinnings of, of what we are and what we do. Here I've got a, you know, a number of words, but they, they really do matter. There's a number of um, points in that I've highlighted in yellow. Actually, have I just highlighted? There we go. Yeah. So this is really our mission statement. And I think it's important to pay attention to some of the differentiators because I would argue that Waterloo entered the world of online education uh, kind of late. We're a bit of a Johnny come lately, quite frankly. And, and so we had to differentiate ourselves when we came into the market, representing what we are as an organization. So things like experiential is incredibly important because we have a massive co-op capability at Waterloo. It's, it's experiential by, by design. Uh, and certainly our focus around technology and disruption is at the core of what we do. So uh, quickly, uh, this, is, this is the agenda. I, I won't kind of read it to you, but wh what I'm really gonna talk about is the critical importance of partnerships. So I will, in many ways, compliment, I think, what Tricia said in her piece earlier, uh, but I'll actually also maybe counter a couple of the points as well, just to kind of keep it interesting. So first of all, uh, what is the challenge? First challenge, of course, is um, if you, pay attention at all to the World Economic Forum and uh, the, the future jobs report. This is a 2020 report, by the way. Uh, clearly, there is, a, there is an inclination for uh, global CEOs, global leaders of companies to spend significantly more over the next still three years, up to 2025, 70% of employers said that they would be investing in upskilling and reskilling of their workforce. So if you take it to more of a Canadian perspective, uh, what we have is uh, of the spend in upskilling, they're hitting all of the key areas of technology. Uh, cloud computing, cybersecurity, kind of the list goes on and on. Uh, this is not, shouldn't be a really big surprise to anybody. What was really interesting to me was the accommodating or the, the, the complementary uh, chart, which is kind of hard to read. But these are the critical skills that are necessary and are, are just as important now for employers in addition to the hard technology skills. So I think about empathy, I think about creativity, I think about teamwork uh, as being just as important now in the workplace as they are as the hard skills. So what have we done as a nation? Um, look, I think we've done a good amount. There's, there's clearly a focus 
uh, in investing. I'm, re I'm reiterating a little bit about becoming, you know, a learning nation. Uh, and I th the investments that our, our, our federal and provincial governments have made uh, in organizations like uh, the Future Skills Center, obviously in the work that eCampus Ontario is doing is critically important. And if, if you, if for those of you maybe who have heard um, the upskilling in industry initiative, the UII initiative, uh, 250 million was awarded to Palette Skills last week. And that's a massive move, I think, forward for institutions. There's a huge requirement as part of that initiative for industry to be very tied with academia. Courses that we produce have to be linked directly, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means, certainly, uh, for us. Okay, so, I'm trying to see my slides over here. Sorry, I keep looking over my, my shoulder. So, um, I think first and foremost, you know, we, we've called out the importance of the skills challenge. Um, over the next 10 years, nine out of 10 skills will require digital capability. So, this is not IT jobs only anymore, folks. This is everybody. Right, and uh, it doesn't matter if you're in the finance industry. It doesn't matter if you are in uh, in a bakery. Everyone's going to be impacted by this, and so uh, this is a bit of a wave that we all have to keep our eye on. Um, no, no industry is impervious. So when you think about the ones that are called up over here, between manufacturing, um, agriculture, retail and accommodation, food services, this is a major component of Canadian GDP that's going to be impacted that today is not really perceived as technology jobs. And then, of course, hyperscale and hyperspeed. Uh, when you talk about technology, uh, this is where our challenge lies. And so trying to keep pace with things like artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and the emerging quantum computing, uh, which is a big part of what the University of Waterloo does, when these technologies hit, they hit like a storm. Um, I will share with you, certainly in, in my previous experience with IBM, it was more than 10 years ago that I was uh, walking across university campuses talking about Watson. I don't know if you guys remember Watson. IBM introduced them on Watson on Jeopardy. Uh, Watson wasn't even connected to the internet at the time and had no natural language processing capability. It was just harnessing tons and tons of data very, very, very quickly and giving you an answer. And, and it was a bit of this, oh, this is, this is interesting. This is going to be, you know, um, uh, Skynet uh, for, for of the future. You know, fast forward to today, and, you know, everyone has, um, is aware of ChatGPT. We held a session last week uh, at the university on the importance of ChatGPT to jobs and to industry and to senior executives in their decision making. Uh, it is a wave because now all of a sudden, everybody has access to the technology. That's the, that's the difference. It's not that uh, it hasn't existed for a long time. It's when it becomes ubiquitous and everyone has access, that's when technology goes to hyperspeed and hyperscale. So I'll jump right to the solution. Um, it requires uh, these three entities to work very closely together. So what? <laughs> it's just, you know, that's it's not a big deal, right? I'm I, this. I'm not. I haven't given you the uh, you know the uh, the secret to solving world hunger or something, right? So it's pretty obvious uh, that the three uh, entities must work together as we move forward. So, but I'll get into kind of the meat of each and every one of these and why it's critically important and what role each of those organizations play in kind of the overall makeup. So the first role for industry is. Um, just identifying skills is not nearly enough for industry. First of all, industry needs to be very comfortable um, in, in, in tapping into their existing talent base. I would argue that it's really, really industry, it's really easy for industry to lay people off than to redeploy them. We've seen that happen in droves of late within the IT space and in the technology sector. Uh, it is also by far cheaper to reskill people than it is to bring in brand new people. Everybody knows that if you've spent any time in HR it's, or in, in managing roles or, or employing roles, uh, that's always the case. The other piece here is industry um, needs to be very comfortable in allocating the time of their own people's resources to go work alongside academics. Why is that important? 
because you get to merge industry awareness, application of the job and the industry with high quality academic content. And when you put those two things together, you get something very, very magical. You get education that actually is impactful. I think um, another key component here is, sorry, I have to keep looking over. It's, it's a little bit tough to see the, uh, the charts in front of me as I'm flipping slides. Um, use in developing um, modules. Uh, sorry, thank you, data, that's data. Um, so the, the point on data here really is, you've often heard probably the term data is the new, is the new currency. Uh, Companies are often hesitant to share data. Uh, this is very, very prevalent in the healthcare space. Obviously, sharing personal health data of, of, of patients is sometimes concerning. Uh, I know I've sat down with CEOs of hospitals who've actually said that their patient health data is considered to be a competitive advantage. So sharing data is not an easy thing. I, I love it when industry comes and says, here's data sets that you can use because generally it's a difficult thing for them to share. And we're not, and not you know, when we talk about data, now we're not just specifically talking about uh, teaching people to work better in database languages like R or SQL or, um, or, or, or Python. What we're talking about is data that tells stories. Capstone projects, very, very, very easy give for industry. Um, why not send uh, an academic institution a project, have it solved for free? You know, the other great advantage of capstones is when you engage learners together in a working environment as a team, you force them to collaborate. And that's critically important in learning job skills before people enter uh, the, the, the workspace. And I'm not talking specifically about capstones for 18 to 22 year olds, folks. I'm talking about capstone projects for professional learners who are looking to upskill themselves. And this is the big one. Um, internships uh, or co-ops or placements. We talked earlier, uh, I know um, Tricia mentioned about industry having a hand in it by the money that they bring to the table. I would argue it's even more than that. Industry has a bigger role. Uh, their skin in the game is to offer up placements, co-ops, and internships. So just think about that for someone who's learning a new skill, looking to enter a new market. If you take this education, at the back end of it is an opportunity with an employer. Maybe there's not a guarantee of a job, but there's a guarantee of an experiential experience with that employer. That is so much more meaningful to anyone looking to reskill or upskill themselves, especially if they're looking to change industries. So really, it is industry has to have some serious skin in the game. So um, talk a little bit about what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, I still am very attuned to what happened at my alma mater at, at IBM. Um, very interesting that IBM has declared that degrees don't matter, at least not nearly as much as they used to. Let me tell you, this is a 180 from when I joined IBM 20 some years ago. If you did not have at least an undergraduate degree preferably an advanced degree, you just couldn't get in. And last year, IBM announced 8,000 of their new hires, which is over 50%, 52% of their new hires in the United States did not have a degree. There's such a massive focus on upskilling and reskilling and what you bring to that role. Um, here's someone who works at a university. So I'm on really, really shaky ground here. But it is what's happening in industry, and we need to pay attention to it. Um, so this is a, a report that came out a couple of weeks ago uh, in Forbes, and future of work, are traditional degrees still worthwhile? So here's where I, I, I get a little bit personal. Um, my belief, and it's, uh, I've got two, um, two adult children in university, unfortunately not at Waterloo, but um, got 50% off tuition. I guess they just didn't want to take, give, the, give their dad a break, you know? But um, they, what you get in the, certainly from an undergrad experience is so much more than the actual hard education and skills that you walk away with. 
I doubt there are many employers out there, especially Fortune 1000 employers, who are going to hire an 18-year-old with no life skills, with no uh, resiliency capability, no experience working in teams, uh, dealing with the distractions that you would have in your undergrad experience uh, or your graduate experience. I think those skills coupled with the hard skills that students get from their 18 to 22 year old experience is still incredibly Im important. And I think that institutions that prepare them beyond just what they need from a hard skill perspective are the ones with a real winning solution to support the, the marketplace. I do not believe degrees are dead. And I'm not saying that just because my paycheck comes from a university. Okay. So, the role of academia. I think the number one role, and I'm speaking really from a university perspective, not from a college perspective, because uh, that's where my experience is. Uh, they need to make sure that they're going to be relevant in the, into the future. What does that mean? So, um, recognizing that learning is a lifelong journey. And I, you know, I go back to the story that I shared with you about why we started Wattspeed. Recognizing that, that the journey of our students does not end when they leave the campus corridor. It goes on for an extended period of time. So the other piece is keeping pace with industry. I'm not saying that <laughs> academic institutions can actually really keep pace with industry. It's more about keeping pace with what's happening in industry and having a clear understanding of what's coming at them. I think there's a lack of appreciation and um, a lack of uh, acknowledgement that the world is changing so incredibly quickly and that universities need to reinvent themselves to be able to keep themselves relevant into the future. And finding, finally, building alliances with industry. Um, building alliances with industry is not about uh, seeking sponsorship for research money. In IBM, we used to have a little saying, you know, what's the academic handshake, please? You know, there's sadly, there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, building alliances with industry from a university perspective means all of those things we, that I shared with you earlier. It is about um, building true partnerships that are advantageous to both the industry partner as well as to the university. It is about sharing um, uh, content. It's about co-development of content. It's about using industry partners as uh, keynote speakers or instructors, professors of practice to go deliver your programs. Having that insight from industry and developing programs tightly aligned with them ultimately is, is, is the difference. So uh, I'm going to talk about culture here fairly quickly because uh, I think it's really, really important to talk about culture. Everyone uh, has probably heard the saying, uh, you know, uh, culture eat strategy for breakfast, uh, Peter Drucker comment from a number of years ago. So what's really important here is um, to understand that there is a natural pushback at universities with regards to micro, not just micro-credentials, but really professional education at large. The other one is, quite frankly, non-credit courses are often viewed as a threat to an institution. Uh, there is a, a perception of lower quality than our degree programs. There's always the concern about some sort of reputational risk. Um, and it's a distraction from its core mission. And I will argue with any university out there that is it, that's not the case. It is part of the core, core mission. A university's mission is to create knowledge and it is to disseminate knowledge, not just to disseminate knowledge to a select few people. The list goes on and on and on of reasons why we shouldn't be heavily into this. So. What, uh, what do universities typically do? Well, they build a building and they erect a sign. And it's, you know, School of Continuing Studies. No offense to any schools of continuing studies. Please, this is not what the intent is, because Waterloo did the exact same thing, right? And uh, it's typically not in line uh, to the academic mission or brand. It kind of sits on the fringes a little bit. Um, typically, there's a lack of faculty support as part of this. Um, there's usually more of a community focus, and I, that's not a bad thing. That's why I've got kind of like a, a, a not a smiley face, but kind of like a, a neutral face. And, you know, typically using courses that are developed by third parties. And that's not necessarily a, a negative thing either. So what have we done differently? You know, what makes Waterloo and Wattspeed so great other than, you know, I'm part of it. But um, 
we, we, what we did was we integrated to the culture of the university. First and foremost, we got buy-in from the deans. Um, and I don't think this is fairly typical for, for most uh, continuing ed organizations. Uh, getting buy-in from our deans was critically important because we wanted to tie ourselves to the faculty. Why? Not because we think we're great. Honestly, it's because industry said the reason why we are gonna come take programming from Waterloo is we want access to the brains. We want access to your, your faculty. We want access to the research that's coming out of their labs so that we're always on the bleeding edge of technology and not kind of looking in the rear view mirror. Keep going here really quickly because I'm running out of time here. Uh, we do have a faculty first model. We think that's critically important because it does engage the community. But we have to think about all sorts of different things about equity for our faculty. How do we pay and compensate uh, carefully? Don't overload them on their teaching and research and, and, and other requirements that they get essentially uh, ranked and, and paid on. So that was a, a critical matter for us. Finally, um, it just doesn't happen uh, overnight. There's a reason why this has been a little bit easier at the University of Waterloo. Uh, we do call ourselves an unconventional university. We were not founded by academics or by government. We were founded by industry. Local industry players post-war, 1957, who wanted to have more engineers in their factories. And so they said, let's build a different kind of institution, one that you go to school for three months, and then you come work for three months, and back and forth, and there was created the co-op program. We have 24,000 placements a year in program and with, with our co-op students around the world. Um, we, we, yeah, our reputation was built on co-op. Commitment to entrepreneurs, huge focus for, for Waterloo. Obviously, we create tons of entrepreneurs. We have one of the country's largest incubators for entrepreneurship. That resonates across the university. IP is critically important, and we can't lose sight of this. We have an, inv we have an inventor-owned IP policy at the University of Waterloo. That extends to the content that they use in teaching. So for us, it's been easier to engage faculty members because we engage them in essentially a business arrangement. Uh, and th we don't have the challenges of content being owned by the university. It's actually owned by the professor. So it makes our contracting with profs a lot easier. And we have no business faculty. How's that an advantage? Well, it's, it's really about interdisciplinary. Business resonates across all of our six faculties. And often in a executive, corporate, or professional education arm of a university, it stems out of the business school, and it kind of sits there, and it get, gets contained there. For us, the advantage is we get to use um, faculty members from arts, from environment, from health, uh, science, as well, of course, math and engineering. So just really quickly on government, um, I would just close this with, uh, I really do believe the job of government is to be focused on the recognition of assessments. At the end of the day, if, you, if learners know that the education they're taking, whether it's from a university, college, or a third party provider, is going to be recognized by the government and the employer. And so that I think is critically important for government to manage to, to some degree lightweight control of that and governance of that sort of model. And just before I finish off here, um, I will leave you with, I, I did want to talk about New Zealand and Australia because they're, they're way ahead of us. And so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. They're doing some remarkable things there with regards to um, what they're producing. Uh, New Zealand is incredibly comprehensive in their approach to this. So there's certainly models that we can, we can replicate. Uh, I will leave you with this. So I believe that our aspiration should be to build the world's most coveted workforce. That does not mean the world's cheapest workforce. That does not mean a workforce that's predicated on the, where our dollar happens to be because we know that fluctuates and we know the impact that that's certainly had, especially in this province on our automotive industry. But a workforce that is continuously and constantly upskilled that always has a radar on national skills. And or I, I believe ultimately that will result in significant more uh, direct foreign investment into Canada and ultimately leading to prosperity, uh, more jobs and uh, you know, more competitiveness for, for, for the Canadian workforce and for Canadians. Thank you very much. I'll leave it for questions. Thank you for this, this is great. Um, 
one of my questions about uh, the upskilling and making sure that we can have people moving from one area to the other um, is, again, fantastic. One of the things that I see, it's not really a question, but more so I'd really like to see also some space in these conversations about um, not just the resources that employers, government, and academia can kind of give to um, the individual within that workspace, but also taking into consideration what happens out. So things like um, continued professional development where there's internships available, we <laughs> many of us might know about caretaking in the past two years. And so those things provide this limitation and barrier to an accessibility that as we do still have, we have great conversations now coming out about equality, diversity, um, breaking down barriers. But it'd be really great to see that included in these conversations when we are going forward, is that we also take a look at, that we actually continue to take a look at um, incorporating like the, I can't remember, I don't know what the word is think I'm thinking of, but if we are going to be, we saw emotional intelligence as number seven. And if empathy is part of that, it really still, I, I really would love to see that the fact that people believe that we're all humans outside of work, whether we're on Zoom or in, in the office, um, still exists. Like I've never seen such um, an equalizer as the past couple years in where people who um, never seem to, uh, I think the whole idea of family, um, pets even, is a lot more um, apparent and it's a lot more obvious and it doesn't seem to be kind of ignored as much. However, I, I'm afraid of a backslide and then the consequences of that is that um, there may be other people who are, so while everybody's being able to transfer their skills into another industry or into another, um, another position, they might be the same group of people. And so those who do have these skills, they might also already have these skills, might not have a voice yet with if there's no conversation about how do we get people who are not even currently employed but also um, not currently employed in kind of these industries that we're recognizing but like even outside as well. Um, so yeah. uh, is that, that's more of a comment though, right? Just I believe more of a you comment yeah, about okay. the space, yes. Okay. About it, it's, it's about providing all these opportunities is great. And it's great that we have the opportunities, but what are the barriers for people to taking these opportunities? And are the same people who don't have accessibility to opportunities that we have now, is it just gonna continue and perpetuate? And so only a certain group demographic will get these opportunities or able to. Thank you for that comment. Um, I'm over time. Uh, I just want to take one second. Someone asked a question earlier about associations. Happy to, to chat about that. We've worked with the uh, CPA Ontario, Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, uh, CHIMA. We're also starting conversations with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. So yeah, there is a distinct value in working with associations and I'm happy to have that conversation. Oh, I'm okay for five minutes. Why was I rushing? <laughs> Any other questions? Me? Yeah. Um, um, I have one over here, sorry. Way this side, back over here. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was reflecting on what you had said, some of the solutions you think are, particularly in terms of industry, but there's a flip side of that of the academic side. If you're hosting capstones, you have professors teaching them. If you're hosting co-ops, you need administrative support to be able to run them. Um, I think the model you talked about works really well in your Waterloo's and your U of T's and your McGill's and people with resources, maybe less so in institutions like I went to at St. FX University in Anaganish, Nova Scotia. Um, I'm curious on what you think kind of the design to solutions look like in institutions where there is limited resources uh, in terms of people capacity, financial capacity, and partners within the communities? Um, that's a really good question because, yeah, we do, we, you know, I, we sit in a spot where we have a lot of those resources um, and we can access them fairly quickly. And by the way, I, I'm also a Nova Scotia graduate from Dalhousie, so. Um, so, um, it, it, there, it's, a, it's a different engagement model. Right, we, we've been able to build a, a lot of our stuff from scratch because we can tap into a, a large amount of resources at, at certainly at Waterloo. And I, I would say you're absolutely right. Larger institutions can do exactly that. 
Uh, the smaller institutions, frankly, have to look at a different model. Uh, and it's one that probably engages industry to a deeper extent, uh, especially I, I, you would think that some of the larger institutions will generally be more focused on industries that are local to them as well. So it's community engagement that's critical, I think, for them to be able to succeed. And I, I wouldn't say to compete. I really wouldn't because I, I, you know, we've carved out a niche for ourselves where we think this is where, this is where, we're, where, we're, where we are going to play because we think that's where we bring value. I think every institution has to declare what their own value is. And for some, creating a placement capability may not be the right fit for what they're able to actually um, accomplish within, uh, within their framework and the resources that they have available to them. Others will have to rely very significantly on industry involvement to accommodate for that. And that goes back to, I think, Trisha's comments about, you know, where's the money coming from? Some will come from, from government, uh, but industry has to pony up because every institution yet doesn't have a massive co-op organization or have a, a large administrative um, uh, pool of individuals that they can use from. So I don't have, I don't have a, a straight answer for you other than it's got to be a different model than what the big guys are doing. Thank you, Sanjeev, for, s for the uh, presentation. I think, uh, for me, this is great because the first thing is my 18-year-old just got through Waterloo, and the first thing she said is, I have a co-op. <laughs> so thank you. The second thing is about the what speed part, and uh, I was just wondering, one of the programs that I've been following is the Digital Transformation Program. I'm not sure if it's a micro-credential, but if it is, my question was just around what worked for the program and what are the new things that, you know, after running that program, because when we talk about digital transformation, it's so much about the culture, you know. I know that program was for the engineers, but still my questions are primarily to what worked and what are the things that you would change in the next iteration? So, so we started digital transformation mm -hmm. targeting engineers, and in fact, that was our early uh, partnership with Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. What's interesting to point out is only until this year has the engineering profession required CPD hours. They never had them before. Which, yeah, I know, I see the jaws, so I'll go, seriously, is that how to, but that's the case. So um, what we realized was we actually weren't getting a lot of um, stickiness with that program because we were only targeting the engineering community. As soon as we opened it up to a broader community, because digital transformation is for everyone, you don't have to be an engineer to, to be dealing with digital transformation in today's workforce. Um, we got a massive uptick. So some of the elements of that particular program is it is limiting because there's a high degree of what we call white glove in, in, in that offering. There's mentorship. There is talking about cultural change. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of teaming activities that go on in that course, but we are limited to 50 people per cohort. And again, one of, my, one of our focuses for Wattspeed is to find out how do we scale that? How do we make our programming more asynchronous uh, to engage more people? Uh, how do we get it out to masses? And how do we let, basically, again, it's about dissemination of knowledge and how do we maximize that dissemination of the knowledge? So, yeah, th there is, um, I'm happy to sit down and share some of the more, you know, trade secrets that we might have that have made some of our programming interesting. Thanks so much for your presentation. Just to maybe to revert back to that business model, um, I come from Brock University, so I loved your comment about uh, being late to the game. I'm essentially setting up a centralized CE unit and, and really looking at business models, having come from executive ed and working in Malaysia and Singapore and, and uh, you know across Europe, they have very different models but here we do too. And so I'd love your comment on maybe some of my approaches or uh, anyone who'd love to talk about co-op competition, cooperation internally, and how some of the smaller uh, institutions can, you know, really work together, whether on social innovation programming or really those mass digital skills that help the economy that help innovation, that help rise, you know, Canada's innovation sector and, and how we respond to where the economy is going. So if you don't mind just commenting on an expansive business model versus the traditional one of in-house. Yeah, so um, first let me share with you our, what our business model actually has been and, and the fastest elevator pitch I can give you. We obviously, we, we pay our faculty members directly for content development and then we pay them separately for instruction. 
then what we do is uh, we return everything that we earn back to the institution. And why we do that is because when you return income to faculties and departments, it actually, um, it engages more people because they can use that income for research, they can use it for whatever they want to use it for. Um, but it does engage a broader audience internally when you're able to return something back to them. But we're also not in it to make money. And I, I say that very seriously because I've gotten this resoundingly clear from our deans. Put prestige over profits. So that's a big part of upholding reputation. Academic quality is incredibly more important to us uh, than, than our, is the profit size. But, but it is great when we can return income back to the institution. So Wattspeed has been set up as uh, an academic support unit, not as an ancillary business unit. And that's one of the fundamental differences about how we set things up from a business construct. Oh, oh. Rich? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when I'm getting the hook. I'm okay. One more. All right. Uh, hello. Thank you for your presentation. And I have maybe like uh, a more theoretical question to ask you. But uh, since you represent uh, uh, an academia, right, and an innovation as well, and you mentioned that within a decade you think that a disruptive technology or an innovation will come. So the question is do you think that we, uh, and academia uh, can, and if we can, right, in any way, like, to prepare for jobs that don't exist yet, right, so. Uh, yeah, if there is any, like, how would, it, so it is, like you mentioned, okay, it is coming, right, the quantum uh, computer is coming, so there will be disruptive innovation, right, okay, within, like, some period of time, but we are at this point, what, how would you, like, what would be, like, the model of framework, right? Yeah, okay. so, to so prepare it to something that doesn't exist yet. Right? Yeah, so the first of all, the answer is yes. <laughs> University, <laughs> academic institutions must, must pay attention to what's, what's where, where things are going. I think institutions who have robust research organizations have a really, really important job to do for everybody else because it is their job to reach into sectors and not to be thinking about what's happening now, but what's happening, what's going to happen five years from now. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about in the care in the area of quantum, for example, um, how's quantum nano going to affect healthcare industry? How's it going to affect X-rays and um, you know um, uh, of you know and 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 disease detection? These are massive game changers in industry, and those that science will dictate ultimately where the jobs of the future are. And then it's our job then to connect those researchers with industry leaders and obviously with government leaders to sort of define what the future looks like. So yes, there's a, a huge role for universities, especially in, in colleges, those with large research arms, to contribute to that roadmap of, of the jobs of the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, I really loved the approach you took uh, to start by zooming out on the lifelong learning journey and uh, recognition of the uh, needs, opportunities, and even some models that exist within uh, industry. It's a good approach. So we're on break again. Um, we will come back at 10 to 3. Um, uh, I invite you to stick around. At 4 o'clock, we will have our networking reception and uh, look forward to connecting with you more there.